So, as you know, we are in Luke this morning, chapter 5, and we'll be picking up at verse 1, and uh, if all goes well, making it down to verse 16. So that's our text, Luke uh, 5, beginning at verse 1. You recall the general context that we're dealing with. I'm calling this kind of major section that we're in right now, which begins midway through chapter 4, uh, the unexpected Messiah. And this is really describing in a variety of ways as Luke approaches it, the way in which Jesus didn't fit, of course, what the people were looking for as a Messiah. And we've suggested that the various aspects of that we might think about would be the unexpected uh, venue of his ministry. You would think the Messiah would head straight to Jerusalem, kind of take over, shake things up, you know. And obviously he's going to do that eventually, but he begins his ministry and really has uh, most of what we call the positive expressions of his ministry in Galilee, the outback, the hinterland. So it's an unexpected venue for the Messiah. I mentioned to you, I think the first week we were together, it'd be something like me telling you that the great world leader, you know, is really shaking things up in Washtuckna. And you go, well... You know, it's not what you expected. You thought, well, if he's such a great leader, he should be somewhere where great leaders resort. And yet here he is out there in these uh, kind of backwoods uh, sort of regions. So it's the unexpected venue that Jesus uh, locates himself. And then we'll have the unexpected message. The, the, the Messiah was expected to be one of great powerful judgment. And indeed, he would become that. John the Baptist predicted it. And, of course, Jesus, by the time we get to the Olivet Discourse, is giving us that. But the, be, the beginning of his ministry is unexpected because it's a message of forgiveness. It's grace. It's mercy. It's turn the other cheek. It's not very messianic in the ways that people were expecting it in those days. And finally, it's the unexpected mission. What is the Messiah going to accomplish? Everybody thought they knew, but he comes on with a very different kind of drumbeat. And so all of those taken together are the chapters we're looking at right now. Chapters 4, roughly through chapter 9, would be those. And we're just finishing this morning the first of those, the unexpected venue. So let me say a little bit about that since we're kind of wrapping this up. Um, the, if, you, if you think about it, this discussion which goes from about the middle of 4 to the middle of 5 has found Jesus in three different spots. First, Nazareth, the synagogue there, then Capernaum, the synagogue there, and now, this morning, by the side of the sea. Two synagogues, one seashore, you see. Uh, his experience in both of the synagogues, negative. The first one, Nazareth, his hometown. You'd think hometown boy makes good, that should be in the newspapers. But when he actually shows up, begins talking in the synagogue, and announces himself using the text from Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, etc. Today these things are fully realized in your hearing. It doesn't provoke pride among these people, but they're outraged. Outraged to the point that they grab him by the nap of the neck, drag him out of town, want to throw him headlong over the side of the cliff. In other words, the first reaction that we get from him is a kind of outrageous, over-the-top anger, you know, uh, way beyond what you'd expect, disproportionate outrage at this one. That's what we have in Nazareth. Then we go to Capernaum, that was last week, and he's in the synagogue again, and there he confronts a demon, and the demon's response is one of cowering terror. Remember, ah, that was the Greek word. You can, all, you can tell people from now on, you know some Greek. That's the Greek word. Ah! You know, get away from me. Leave me alone. It's almost like some little kid in the face of a bully. You know, that's exactly the way the demon is responding. So you have this, on the one hand, great outrageous anger, and on the other hand, a kind of cowering terror. Both of these being reactions to the evident authority of Jesus. And now we come to the third reaction. I kind of, as I was reflecting on this, it reminded me of, you know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. 
that's the level at which I normally think. So in case you wonder, that's, that's kind of my MO. I think about there. And so I was thinking of Goldilocks, and you remember how it goes. Oh, this porridge is too hot, and this porridge is too cold, and then this porridge is just right. Remember that? Deep theology. Well, that's really what Luke is doing. Nazareth, too hot. Outrage, anger, throw him over the cliff, get rid of this guy. Capernaum, too cold. Get away from me. Cowering terror, afraid of him, you see. And now we come to the Sea of Galilee. And here, of course, the critical statement, the one that just captures, in a sense for Luke, the essence of what the right response to Jesus is, are going to be these words from Peter, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Verse 8 of this chapter. That's kind of the centerpiece, and so we want to think about that as we go along. So anyway, we're coming to chapter 5, and before we read, I want to plug a book I have not yet read, <laughs> but soon will, but I can with the highest degree of confidence tell you this will be one of the best books you've ever read. Written by our own Howard Steen, and it's entitled uh, Reflections on Life, the Exit Lane. And it just looks like a wonderful collection of thoughtful reflections. If you've read anything that Howard has written, you know that he is just a, you know, to be a science teacher, the guy is just amazingly interesting, you know. And, uh, and uh, that's, I only say that because I never did science. <laughs> Somebody said, but you don't write like a scientist. Yeah, that's right. He doesn't write like a scientist. So anyway, if you're interested in this, be sure to see Pat, who I'm honored to have right up here in the front row with us. So thank you. All right, so let's, uh, let's have a word of, well, no, let's read the text, and then we'll have a word of prayer. So here we are, uh, Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. This is the word of God. And it came about as the crowd was pressing him in order to hear the word of God, and he himself standing at the edge of the lake Gennesaret, he saw two boats standing beside the sea, and the fishers of those boats had left to clean their nets. He entered one of the boats, that of Simon, and asked him to push out a little bit into the water. And he sat down in the boat and taught the crowds. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, push out into the deep and let down your net for a catch. Simon answered saying, Master, the entire night we have wearied ourselves and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when he had done this, it was enclosed with a great catch of fish, so much so that the nets were tearing. And they called out to their partners in the other boat and asked them to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so much so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell on his knees before Jesus, saying, Depart from me, because I am a sinful man, Lord. Astonished with deep dread, along with all of those who were with him, who had seen the great catch of fish, including James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners of Simon. And he said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will catch men. They pulled the boats to the shore and left everything behind and followed him. As he was in one of their cities, Look, a man filled with leprosy. When he saw Jesus, he fell on his face before him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you are able to make me clean. And he stretched forth his hand and touched him and said, I am willing, be clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. 
And he warned him to tell no one, but to go and present himself to the priest and offer concerning his cleansing that which Moses prescribed as a witness to them. But the word concerning him went out into all the region. So crowds came to hear and to be healed of all their diseases. But Jesus went out into the desert and prayed. So there's our text. Let's ask God's blessing on our consideration of it. Father, we are grateful for this story that describes Peter, this one who eventually became such an important figure in the history of your church. And yet, as he initially catches a glimpse of the glory of Christ, he can only say, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. We pray that as we reflect on this text, we would also catch a glimpse of the glory of Christ, and if necessary, catch a glimpse of our own hearts as well, so that we can join in that sincere recognition of the very basis upon which repentance begins and a true discipleship can commence. We give you thanks for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is one of my favorite stories. I, you know, I like this because it reminds me of all the wonderful Sunday school lessons that I heard growing up. And this was one of my favorite stories, The Big Catch of Fish, because it reminded me of that one day I was about eight years old and my dad took me fishing. Uh, he took me fishing many times, but this one in particular, to Lake Roosevelt. And for whatever reasons, that day I was the only one that caught fish and I just caught them all day long. Everybody, uh, we, we just fished off the little dock there. I don't know, is Dad in here? I don't see him in here, but I might remember that. But we were fishing off the dock, and I just kept throwing in my hook, and within 15 seconds, out, now these are perch, you know, but nevertheless, it was fish. And for me, at eight years old, that's all it took. And everybody else was looking, what kind of bait was I using? What was this? What was that? Like I knew what I was doing, and I didn't know. I just kept catching fish. And uh, so I've always identified with this story because Peter kept catching fish. I didn't say, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. I didn't get the biblical message out of it, but it was sure a lot of fun. So anyway, what do we have? Well, it came about that as the crowds were pressing him to hear the word of God, he himself was standing at the edge of Lake Gennesaret. This is another name for, the, for Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. So we're in the same place. Interesting, of course, the first two settings in which we've seen Jesus in this section were in religious settings. Synagogue of Nazareth, synagogue of Capernaum. And there, the reaction in each case was negative. Now Jesus is out, as it were, in the place of labor, on the street, or by the shore. This is where work is going on. It's uh, undoubtedly fairly early in the morning. These guys who were professional fishermen would go out what we would consider to be in the middle of the night. They'd get out there maybe 2.30, 3 a.m., and of course that would be the best time to do their labor. And for several hours, they would be engaged in catching fish, hopefully. Today was not so uh, good for them, at least uh, during their night uh, labors. Then they'd come and, and uh, maybe uh, early morning, say 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m., they'd be done. The sun is rising. They'd be taking care of the fish, preparing them for the marketplace, cleaning their nets, hanging them up to dry, getting ready, of course, for the rhythm of the uh, profession to carry them on. And so that's where we are. So we're probably fairly early in the morning. These guys have finished their labors through the night. Uh, but, of course, the catch has not been so uh, positive this time. They haven't taken anything, but here we are. That's where Jesus is, not in a synagogue, but out here in the place of labor. And the labor, of course, is not sophisticated. It's not scholarly labor. He's not in the university. He's not hobnogging uh, uh, with the, you know, the PhDs of the town and so on. These are the blue-collar workers. These are the people that do the, the, the hard labor, good labor, honorable labor, but it's you know, considered the uh, kind of the... Uh, the basic uh, level of production in that society, and so here he is uh, with them uh, by the side of the sea. And he saw two boats uh, literally standing beside the sea, uh, but the fishers uh, from them were out cleaning their nets, so the day is over in terms of their working day, they're finishing up, they're cleaning their nets, and so Jesus uh, then, verse 3, uh, entered into or got into one of the boats, that which belonged to Simon. 
uh, and requested him to push out a little bit. And he sat down in the boat and taught the crowds. We've been introduced to Simon last week. No particular explanation, from Luke at least, except that we knew that Jesus entered his house, his mother-in-law was ill. Jesus, of course, heals her. That's the only acquaintance we know of so far between Jesus and Simon, but at least it says to us there was something going on. There was some kind of relationship. We don't know if they'd had conversations. We don't know exactly what the tenor of that was. In Luke's uh, version of this, we simply know that there was some connection there. So Jesus isn't simply getting into somebody's boat with whom he has no acquaintance. Here he is by the side of the sea, and it happens to be Simon's boat, and he requests him to push out a little bit into the, into the water. My imagination tells me that th at this point, Simon was interested in Jesus, he was fascinated with him, probably regarded Jesus as being in a wholly different class. Here he is, he's a preacher, the crowds are resorting to him, he's able to heal, he's a miracle worker, you know, probably a fairly rudimentary theology is developing in Simon's mind, but he doesn't regard himself as a scholar, he doesn't regard himself as someone that has any great uh, theological insights beyond what a, a a person might simply surmise by observation. So that's, that's what my mind's eye tells me. I don't know if it's correct or not, but probably something like that. So anyway, Jesus is in the boat. They pushes out. He talks to the crowd. Don't know what he said. Um, Luke doesn't bother to tell us. We have an impression from Luke and the other gospel writers that Jesus had a fairly standard message. He gave the same message probably many times. What we get in the Sermon on the Mount appears to be a distilling of the common themes. He taught in parables. We probably have many or most of the parables. We don't know that, but we would guess that. He, he had these basic ethical themes. If your enemy's hungry, you know, uh, if he strikes you, if you want your coat, those things, you know how to fill in the blanks and all of those. These are common, and we think of these, in, of course, in connection with the ministry of Christ. And I think we can assume that was the kind of thing that he communicated here. Uh, I've heard it said once that it's much easier to change audiences than to change messages. And that's true. If I had a different group in Sunday school every week, I could give the same Sunday school lesson over and over. But you people keep showing up, you see. So I have to do all the work of getting a new Sunday school lesson. Well, actually, I'm delighted to do that, and I appreciate your coming, so please don't misunderstand me there. But, uh, you know, I think probably Jesus, going from city to city, town to town, probably there was a lot of common themes that we find, and the disciples, as they record these and, and, and reproduce them later for us, are giving us those kind of common denominators that were, that were typical of his message. So we'll assume that was the case in this particular instance. So when he had finished speaking, verse 4, he said to Simon, push out into the bathos, into the deep, into the bath, and lower your net for a catch. Jesus doesn't say for a great catch, for a miracle, for, you know, some astonishing, you know, display of my power, just for a catch. Uh, the, the, the tenor of this is simply, hey, let's, let's take one more run at it. You know, let's see if we can catch a fish or two out here. Uh, so it's, it's not uh, setting Peter up necessarily for some expectation of a miraculous visitation, but it's more or less kind of an ah shucks uh, sort of phrase, the way that we find it here. Uh, and let down your net for a catch. Now we have to understand, Peter has just been, has spent about an hour cleaning his nets. You know. That's, that's a fairly arduous task in itself. He has spent the night from 2 a.m., let's say until about 8.30, uh, you know, d d putting the nets in. He's gotten nothing. He's gotten shoelaces, seaweeds, you know, junk, no fish. And now he has to go through and little piece at a time, pull it all out because that's what they did in order to hang the nets up to dry. And he's just finishing and Jesus says, hey, let's try one more time. You can almost hear the, the little bit of aggravation in Peter as he responds to this. And uh, verse 5, uh, Peter responded saying, Master, interesting word, it's the only, the, this word epistata means the ones, ones who stands up front. It's a word for teacher which is 
only used by Luke and doesn't have a particularly religious connotation to it. It's not like the word rabbi or didaskalos. It's this word that simply means a kind of generic teacher. Interesting uh, choice of words here that Luke uses, but that's the word. Teacher, kind of a distance there, in other words, not, not reflecting, let's say, great allegiance. I think that's the sense of it. Peter is still a little bit standoffish. At least that's the implication of the word teacher. Uh, the whole night we have wearied ourselves, literally, uh, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, we'll let down the nets. I, I, I'm going to push my luck here a little bit with Peter. I'm guessing what's in his mind. You know something, uh, Jesus, I'm sure you know about theology and Bible and stuff like that, but I'm a fisherman. I've been doing this for years. I know when you're supposed to fish. I know when you're supposed to pack it in. I know where the fish are. I know where they're probably not. I know my trade. And hey, I've been doing this for a long time, and this whole evening, I have, or this whole morning, I've been working at this, and I've taken nothing. I don't think there's any fish out there, but here's patronizing Peter, you know, <laughs> just because you are asking, I'll do it. Almost as if he's saying, I'm, I'll show you, you know. Sure, I'll let down the net. You'll see. So I don't know. You ever felt that way with Jesus? Jesus says, push out into the deep. Well, Jesus, you'll see. Now, devotional commentators on this text always love to leap onto the phrase, and, and I'm going to do it as well, you know, push out into the deep. Um, because sometimes that's what Jesus tells us to do. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I kind of recoil from pushing out into the deep. I know what I like to do. I know where I feel a little bit exposed. My competence weans, you know, goes thin. But sometimes Jesus will tell you to push out into the deep, to go where you feel less than comfortable or competent. And uh, when he tells you to do that, you need to just buck up, get over it, take the risk, take the gamble on the assumption that he'll be with you. Uh, in this case, of course, it's not quite that because the deep for Peter is the place of familiarity. He's been out there in the deep many times, but uh, nevertheless, you can uh, muse on that. So, so Peter uh, says, okay, we'll do it. So he, there they go. They, uh, uh, when he had done this, verse 6, um, there was enclosed, literally, a great catch of fish. Luke uses plethos, great, and palu, many. It's emphatic, so it's a huge catch of fish here, uh, just over the top, so much so that the nets were beginning to break. So this dramatic and unexpected uh, development. I've, I was reading comments this last week, as I typically do on this text, and, and you know, it's always fun to read commentaries and find out where they have their debates. It reminds me, last week I was mentioning the scribes who would debate little innocuous curiosities. And this is what you get. The, the, the big debate in this verse is, were these fish created miraculously? Or were they already there, but hiding, you know? <laughs> you think, yeah, boy, that's, that's a question I wish I knew the answer to. And so if you were rolling out of bed this morning with that burning question in your mind, I hope he'll clarify that. You know, it's sort of like up there with how many angels really can dance on the head of a pin kind of stuff. And so anyway, I don't know. I'm going to disappoint you. I have no idea. I rather think the fish were already there, and they were just maneuvered in God's providence into the net. But if you have a different view, God bless you. But who cares? <laughs> what we do know is that, as uh, Luke tells the story, there's this huge catch of fish that's enclosed, so much so that it's tearing the net. So they called out to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they began, of course, loading the fish into the boat. So they were both beginning to sink. So here we have this remarkable display of God's power that is overwhelming all of the natural means 
to do the very thing they were professionally trained to do. That here is Jesus who is so displaying his power that even these who are competent and trained and experienced are unable to handle it. And so that's the, uh, that's the deal. And then we have verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell on his knees uh, before Jesus. Now, what's interesting here is that the phrase Simon Peter, Simon Petros, this is the only time in the entire book of Luke that that name is used in that way, the double name, Simon Peter. Luke will refer to Simon as Simon. We will have that occasion when Jesus says, you are Peter, but here, of course, Luke knows we know who this guy is. And so he's using, as it were, virtually his official title as this one who will eventually become so important, one of the transcendently important people in the early church. The first, what, eight chapters of, the, of Acts, which Luke also authors, are centered on this one. Simon Peter, big name, big deal, and Luke purposely uses that very dignified way of referring to him now. But what does he say? Simon Peter, seeing this, fell on his knees before Jesus, saying, Depart from me, because I'm a sinful man, Lord. And notice what that combines. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Now, the people in Nazareth wanted Jesus to depart from them, and they were willing to help out, grabbing him, dragging him out of the sea, trying to throw him off a cliff. They wanted to get rid of him. They said, depart from me, you know. But the sense of that, the meaning of that, was not at all one of repentance or conviction of sin. The demon was saying, depart from me, leave me alone, get away from me. But in the demon, not that we would ever expect it, but again, clearly there's no sense of remorse, no sense of exposure. Get out. You see, everybody wants Jesus to get away from them. Get away from me, get away from me. You know. Peter says, depart from me. In that sense, he's sharing something in common. But what's the reason? For Peter, you see, it's a very different thing. For Peter, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Here's the first one who sees the real reason for the trauma. He's caught a glimpse of the glory of Christ. He's seen the power. He's seen his authority. But at the same time, he has seen himself. And it's the self-exposure that now leads Peter to this kind of trauma. Depart from me. This is so typical of what we encounter throughout the scriptures. The most famous example, at least that comes to my mind, is, is way back with uh, Isaiah. We alluded to this last week. I only told half the story, but you may recall how it goes. Isaiah has this vision. Isaiah chapter 6, the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings, with two he covered his eyes, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew, and one cried out to the other, holy, holy, holy. You might think Isaiah would be just ecstatic with joy to have such a vision. This was the year that King Uzziah died. This was a grim time for Israel. This was a time when they thought maybe they were abandoned. Uzziah died with leprosy. He died in an unhappy circumstance. Many thought this was judgment. And now Isaiah sees the Lord. And you would think Isaiah would go, that's a relief. I'm glad you haven't abandoned us. You're still here. And then what does Isaiah say? What does he say? You know? Woe is, he says, depart from me. Woe is me. You know? I am ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the Lord. You know. Isaiah's exposure to the holiness of God, of course, is an exposure as well of Isaiah to himself. The word, the, uh, the woe oracle. In the Old Testament, you've got wheel oracles and woe oracles. 
wheel oracles, W-E-A-L, wheel, like wealth, were oracles of blessing. Blessed are you. Blessed are you, Israel. God's going to pour out great, great, uh, wonderful provisions for you. Usually it was the false prophets that were giving the wheel oracles, you know. Wheel oracles were usually start with the phrase blessing. Wool oracles could very many times start with the word cursed. Cursed are you. When Isaiah said, woe is me, you know, it was tantamount to saying cursed is Isaiah. I'm undone. I'm disintegrating. I'm fragmenting. Falling apart. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. This is the, 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 the true and authentic experience of brokenness before the holy gaze of God. A recognition not simply of flight or fright, you know, running for cover, but of recognizing our holy, unworthy status in his presence. And you find that again and again, as you're well aware, through Scripture. And you find it here. This is Peter's great turning point. The turning point wasn't, oh, he healed my mother-in-law. He must be the Messiah. I guess I'll follow him. You know, miracle didn't do it. But it was that glimpse of his glory. And Peter now experiences in that context, woe is me. Uh, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. Well, everybody wants to run from Jesus, right? I'm going to give you a little clue. There's not one of us in this room who doesn't, to some degree or other, want to run from Jesus. There is something about him that is terrifying. We find that all the way through the scriptures. Even John, the great apostle, when he's on the Isle of Patmos and has been serving Jesus faithfully for years as an apostle in the church, when he actually sees him, falls on his face like a dead man, terrified, you know. There is something of that terror with respect to Christ. And we all have a kind of instinct to escape. But at the same time, I think we hear at least a little tiny hint in Peter of hope. You know, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. But Peter is on his knees before Jesus. He's not running. And maybe there's the little tiniest hint of hope there. Peter, or Luke goes on. And this is a very interesting phrase, verse 9. Uh, I mentioned last, last week the word thombos. Remember that? That word that means kind of a, a dreadful terror. Luke uses it again here, and he combines it with another word, perieskin, which means astonishment. So it's very emphatic and very kind of uh, uh, strong uh, in the sense that it's saying uh, being astonished with a great dread. That was... That's the way he puts it. That's what Peter was feeling. This great dread mixed with astonishment at simply a catch of fish. I've always wondered about Peter. I thought, you know, if I had been Peter, I would have been grabbing a contract out of my shirt pocket so fast. <laughs> Jesus, just sign right here. You are a full partner. You can go fishing with me anytime you want. You know? You'd think Peter would have seen this is the gravy train you know, this is what I've been looking for, the guy who can always find the fish, and let's build more boats. You know, wouldn't that be kind of the normal response? Peter, however, in spite of what we might have thought would be, be his reaction here, uh, has this, this reaction, uh, you know, I'm a sinful man. There's nothing moral about this miracle. It's not a miracle that should expose us ethic, ethically. It isn't as if there's something here that we would expect. Would, would create that kind of, of uh, sense of our guilt, our unworthiness before him. But somehow or other, Peter was filled with a powerful dread, is the idea. And all of those who were with him, because of this great catch of fish, including uh, James and John, the sons of De Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, all of them were caught in that powerful moment and that feeling of dread, being in the presence of one who could command nature in the way that Jesus could. 
Then Jesus gives this response, and of course this is the, the word of redemption in the story. Um, Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. Do not fear. Uh, from now on, I'm going to make you catch, or you act literally, you will catch men. You know. This, of course, gives rise to one of the most famous little symbols of the Christian faith down through history, uh, which we'll touch on in a second. He, he continued finishing the little story. They drew the boats to the shore. They didn't leave them floating. Drew them to the shore, filled with fish. Didn't even clean the fish, you know. Filled with fish. And they left it all. That's what repentance does. And they followed him. So what happens? There's this sense of utter unworthiness. I've seen Jesus. I'm absolutely unworthy. You are too good for me. You're too holy. Get away from me. I can't stand this gaze. And then what do you have? You have Jesus giving the word, do not fear, you know. And then the, the sort of the, the repentance flows out of a heart of astonished gratitude. If this is how Jesus will treat me, as unworthy as I am, and as holy as he is, then there's nothing else in life that matters. You know? And this is really the heart, isn't it, of Christian understanding. Jesus says, if you put your hand to the plow and turn around and look back, you're not worthy of the kingdom. You know? He who doesn't leave behind houses and lands and family and friends and all of that and follow me is not worthy of me. Jesus is speaking in hyperbole there, but the point is that there is in the, at the core of our understanding, this is the non-negotiable, most important thing. I'm going to attach myself to this one and nothing else is going to come close as a competitor. That's the heart. And that's the response. Not the Nazarene response, throw him off the cliff. Not the Capernaum response, ah, get away from me. But this, this profound sense of gratitude. All right, well, of course, fish, fishing has always been uh, uh, kind of a symbol of the Christian faith. You know, we see it on bumper stickers, but you should know that they had uh, these on bumper stickers in the ancient world as well. And uh, they were chariot stickers back then, but they, uh, uh, this, was a, this was a common uh, symbol for the Christian faith going clear back to the second century. And it was kind of a little, sort of a, uh, what would you say, a little secret code by which Christians could identify each other. And the reason was because the word fish, you, probably many of you know this, uh, is the Greek word ichthus. And Christians figured out pretty early that that made a neat little acrostic. How many of you have seen this at some point? I, I would assume most of you probably have. So... The acrostic is, what's the uh, iota? Jesus. Jesus. What's the chi? Christos. What's the theta? Theos, God. What's the upsilon? Huios, son. And the sigma, soter, savior. Jesus Christ, son of God, savior. And Christians figured out, very early. What a neat way, not only to give a little statement of faith, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, but also a way to sort of, in a almost uh, a cryptogram here, to identify other Christians. I remember when I was at Whitworth, uh, took Greek from uh, my beloved Greek professor back then, Larry Yates, and uh, he said how Christians would, he was sort of imagining they would draw little stick figures in the sand of a fish. You know, they'd be talking to someone on the street and draw a little fish. And if the other person responded to that, then they knew that that person knew the code. That was a Christian. They had the secret handshake, you know. But, uh, but if not, if it's going to pass by them, then they'd know, oh, this person isn't. And that was how they avoided uh, detection. Uh, I think Dr. Yates was probably being slightly apocryphal there, but that was uh, the idea. All right, so anyway, uh, this whole notion of being a fisher of men, a catcher of men, uh, has its roots in this story and others like it. Let's take the next little piece uh, uh, a little bit more quickly. But it, it's the completion of the thought. This is the little story that is the appendix to the story of P 
Peter's repentance that, that completes the thought for us. So here, here's what he says. Uh, it came about as they were in a certain city, a certain town, and look, this is uh, idu, this is just look, is the idea, it's an exclamation, a man filled with leprosy. We're supposed to be horrified at that. That's, uh, that. That has emotional content. In the ancient world, I think you're aware, and certainly right down to the present day, leprosy has a kind of stigma to it, partly because of its biblical treatment. You know, In the Old Testament, lepers were excluded. They were unclean. They were cut off. They were ostracized. They were quarantined. And they had to always announce, as you're well aware, unclean, unclean. And there's a whole system of laws in the Old Testament that deals with leprosy, not unique to the nation of Israel. Lepers throughout the ancient Near East had a rather common lot. And so for Luke to say now, filled with leprosy, we should be going, oh, you know, kind of, this, that's a, it's an awful thought to see such a person, let alone to be such a person. And so here is a person who is regarded as filthy, as unclean. Now, we, we recoil from that because we've got 2,000 years of Christian ethics that has advised us of how unfair that is. But you have to get rid of that for a moment and put yourself back in the skin of a first century reader of this. There was a sense in which to be unclean had a kind of moral overtone to it. This person was to be, was to be rejected as, as just dirty as, as horrible, and, and here's the visible evidence of it, you know. As tragic as that perception seems to us, that was nevertheless the way it was viewed. And that's the way these people, in a sense, viewed themselves. So here's someone filled with leprosy. Read, filled with wickedness, filled with evil, filled with uncleanness, filled with dirt, awful. You know, that's, that's the picture. And seeing Jesus, he fell on his face before him saying, Lord, if you are willing, you are able to make me clean. He fell on his face and makes this statement. If you are, we have an expression, don't we? A person is willing and able. I'm willing and able. It's a nice thing to be willing, but if you're willing and not able, it's not good. If you're able but not willing, that may be even worse, you know. But what a good thing to be to find someone who is willing and able. Well, the leper was perfectly confident that Jesus was able. I know you're able. He had heard the rumors. He knew the story. He knew the report. Jesus was able. He could heal people. He was a miracle worker. But was he willing? You know, here's a guy who is up to his eyeballs with leprosy. He's viewed as corrupted and to be avoided. And now here he is, right before Jesus. I know you're able, but are you willing? In a sense, this is the thought that goes along with Peter, you know. I'm a sinful man. I'm a corrupt man. What can you do for me? I'm not worthy of this. You know. You're willing, or you're able, are you willing? Jesus reached out his hand and touched him, saying, Ah, I will, literally, I am willing. We've learned so far of the ability of Jesus, right? Everything we've read so far has told us how able Jesus is. The question we have not yet quite had answered definitively is how willing is Jesus? And this is where Luke wants us to understand that this one who is so able is also so willing. I'm willing. I will say to Peter, do not fear. I will say to the leper, I am willing. And then this most just amazing little statement. He reached out his hand and touched him. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. It was illegal to touch a leper. It was illegal. And Jesus, when he does this, is, of course, contaminating himself, isn't he? You may recall back when we were talking about the baptism of Jesus, we said Jesus didn't so much get cleansing from the water as he gave cleansing to the water. Remember that line from the baptism account? Same deal here. Jesus is not so much 
getting uncleanness from the leper is giving cleanness to the leper. And there's a sense in which every one of us is a leper. You know, as we come before Jesus, every one of us is filled with leprosy. Is he willing to touch us? Is he willing to contaminate himself? Certainly. But surprise, he doesn't contaminate himself. He decontaminates us, you know. And the law, which was supposed to prevent that kind of contact now, is abrogated. And this has been one of the great calling cards of the Christian church through her history. My favorite story of this, some of you may know this story, is of St. Francis of Assisi, you know, who grew up in a wealthy home and had all the wonderful conveniences of life, but at a certain point in his life felt God was calling him. But he'd always had this almost um, irrational fear of lepers, literally. Lepers were kept in leper colonies and so on. And, and St. Francis had come to the conviction that he would not be a worthy servant of Christ unless he could somehow get over it. And so to get over it, he went to a leper colony. And he looked at these pathetic people, so you know, just touched by this, this uh, disease that, uh, that had cut them off from human contact and so on. And St. Francis, as the story goes, picked out one who seemed to be the most tragic, the most filled with leprosy, you know. And he went up to that one, and he embraced him, and he kissed him, and called him my brother. You know. And that's what the Christian church has done all through her history. It's Christians who have gone to the leper colonies. You know, it's Christians who have gone to the places where others say, oh, those people aren't worth the effort. It's the Christian heart that has followed Jesus' great example, reached out and touched him. I also like the story of John Calvin. He's talking about Jesus broke the law. Well, John Calvin was a very law-abiding citizen as he was there in Geneva. With one exception, there was one point where he would consistently break the law. He was a lawbreaker. The, you know, the kind of the great patron of our Presbyterian church was a lawbreaker. Do you know when he would break the law? Every time the plague, the Black Plague, came sweeping through, as it did uh, from time and again, you know, in that period in, in, uh, West, in uh, European history, the, the ministers in Geneva had a rotation by which they were supposed to go out and, and provide pastoral care to people who had been touched by the plague, which was a rather risky thing to do because it's highly contagious. And so many times these pastors who would go and provide pastoral care would in fact contract the disease themselves. It happened more than once. But these pastors, to their credit, would nevertheless courageously do so because they felt that was what God had called them to do. However, the city council in Geneva viewed John Calvin as so uniquely important in his day so strategic to the Reformation movement in general and certainly to life in Geneva in particular that they would pass a law. You can still find these laws. There's on the books, you know. John Calvin is not permitted to provide pastoral care to people touched by the plague. That was the law. You know, RCW 35.2, there it is. You know, Thou shall not. John Calvin disobeyed the law. <laughs> that was the one point where he engaged in civil disobedience. And when his neighbor came up, he just went and provided pastoral care to people very much at, at you know, his own risk of his own uh, well-being and so on. This is what Christians do. This, we take this somewhat for granted because we're Christians. You know, and we're part of this great Christian tradition. But the first readers of Luke who read a statement like this, he reached out and touched him. I don't think we can even properly imagine what a radical, revolutionary, unexpected, dramatic statement such a thing would be. And it's really the essence of the Christian gospel. It was a man filled with leprosy, but Jesus reached out and touched him, as he has every one of us, you see, reaching out and touching us and saying, I will be clean. So here it is. Then he said, this is verse 14, he warned him not to tell anybody, meaning go out and just kind of popularly spread the word uh, here and there, but 
to go and present himself to, singular, the priest, which at least impliedly suggests going to the center of the Jewish religion and present yourself there to the priest uh, uh, and offer, literally, according to uh, the cleansing prescribed by Moses. In other words, if a leper was found to be cleansed, that is, healed of their leprosy, recovered, they would go, they'd make an offering in the temple, and the, the priest would examine them and find that they were clean, and indeed, you know, that they would be pronounced clean officially. But notice, Jesus says, I want you to do this as a testimony to them. This is what I'm calling Jesus' first shot across the bow. You know, he's saying to the entrenched, powerful, corrupt leadership that was running the temple and was exercising a kind of usurping totalitarianism in ancient Israel that Jesus intended to destroy. This is his first little warning shot. You go and you show yourself to the priest as a testimony to him. You know, there's a miracle worker afoot. There's a Messiah out there. There's somebody who's healing, cleansing people who are filled with leprosy. You go tell them that. So Jesus isn't telling this man not to tell anybody. He's not just saying, now shut your mouth, don't say a word about it. But what Jesus doesn't want is just this popular kind of, you know, miracle worker sort of a reputation to spread around. There's a much more kind of laser beam point to Jesus' uh, tactics at this, uh, this juncture, and he sends him uh, to Jerusalem. Although, in spite of that, of course, the word concerning him spread through the region. Crowds came to, be, to hear him and to be healed of all of their diseases. And then Jesus himself, however, went out, went away into the wilderness and prayed. Why did he go out and pray? Probably it's this continuing theme that, that Luke is going to keep before us, that Jesus was always being tempted. The devil was always trying to get Jesus to divert himself. Come on, Jesus, just become a miracle worker. Look at, Just turn those stones into bread for those people. Just become the, the Messiah that everybody wants. Come, look, how, look how happy this guy is. And just think of all the other people you could make happy if you would just go and heal their diseases. And, and Jesus has to keep coming back to that razor edge. What is his real mission? He certainly heals people. He certainly feeds them. He certainly does all these remarkable things. But his real purpose, his messianic mission, of course, was of a different shape. And in a sense, I think Luke is saying to us that as Jesus prayed, he was keeping that refined focus in his own mind, in his own ministry, uh, as well as for his followers. Heavenly Father, we are deeply grateful for this remarkable and wonderful story. This one who became such an important pillar in the early church, one who carried so much of the weight of ministry, especially at the beginning, started out as a man on his knees at the feet of Jesus saying, depart from me. And how many times have we felt that? We felt we've fallen so miserably short of what you've called us to, we wanted to say, depart from me. Only to hear your words of forgiveness and redemption and hope, fear not. We thank you for the wonderful reminder we have of that from this text. We pray that you would keep that in our hearts and minds as we seek to find ways to serve you in whatever the calling is in our lives. Pray for the service that follows now, that your presence would be evident and your blessing would be rich. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.